What's up y'all? Welcome back to another Fish the Moment live stream. Tonight I am flying solo because Randy is over at Pickwick Lake fishing the Toyota Series Championship. We're going to be having him back next week to talk about the Toyota Series Championship and his tournament on Grand Lake and we'll be breaking down his tournament patterns, what went right, what went wrong. Definitely follow his YouTube channel and two to angle with Randy Blockett if you want to keep up to date with his tournament progress. But today, since I'm flying solo, I wanted to throw some interesting ideas at you guys. You guys know I love to come up with interesting theories and kind of uh, think about fishing in a different way. And that's what I want to talk about today in two different ways. The first is talking about how I decide to fish deep or shallow. I have a very specific checklist that I follow. There's five, basically, items that I check off when I get to the lake to determine if I'm going to fish shallow or if I'm going to fish offshore. Now, I'm going to explain how I make that decision and actually why I chose this topic as well because I want to look at a recent tournament that kind of sparked this idea. And now I'll take about half the stream, and then the other half of the stream, I'm going to give you guys a new concept that I've been thinking about in terms of how to actually... Think about bass fishing, how to simplify my own bass fishing. And I don't know if you guys are going to enjoy, if uh, if it's something that you guys would think will work. I want to throw the idea out there and I want to have a discussion with you guys over here live in the in the chat and also afterwards on YouTube. So make sure you're commenting in the second half of the stream because it's definitely going to be more of like a conversation than me just talking at the screen. The first half is going to be more of like a seminar almost and the second half is going to be more interactive. So uh, without further ado, let's jump straight into it. First things first though, before we get anywhere, we have to shout out our sponsors. First up is Bridgeford. Bridgeford beef jerky right here. It is uh, the best beef jerky I've ever had. It's super tender, soft. It's a great snack on the boat. And every single week we do a giveaway for a package of Bridgeford beef jerky, which is really, really cool. And we announce the winner of this every single week on the live stream. I'm actually going to hold off on this because for some reason people have not been seeing it in the first bit of the stream, so uh, I don't know if it cuts off or something. So I'm going to uh, share the winner here in just a second, but uh, we're definitely going to be doing another giveaway tonight for a free case of Bridgeford Beef Jerky, 12 packages. Huge shout out to Bridgeford. I see uh, one of the top comments here, Astrophysicist guy says, still enjoying the case of Bridgeford Beef Jerky you won a few weeks ago. Uh, had a half a bag today. Glad that you were able to get that in and um, really appreciate everyone who um, you know, signs up for the giveaways and has a chance to win some beef jerky and huge shout out to Bridgeford for supporting the Fish Moment live stream. Our other sponsor that we have for the live stream is The Bass Tank. And I'm going to talk about them here in just a little bit. We'll hold off on that for uh, just a couple of minutes because the owner of The Bass Tank, or one of the owners, John Sukup, actually did really well in a recent tournament we're about to talk about. So let's just jump straight into it, guys. Let's start talking about how to choose between fishing shallow and fishing offshore. Now, I want to take a little bit of time. Let me just pull up my list here on my phone. I want to take a little bit of time to explain what I'm talking about between shallow and offshore. Because I think some guys who might be watching this might not know exactly what that means. So if I transition here over to a Navionics, I'm just going to pull up, uh, we'll just pull up Grand Lake here. We'll pull up Lake Uchi here. It's a little lake. It's just a small lake, nothing crazy. And basically, if you look at this lake, you can basically break it up into shallow areas and offshore areas by drawing a line out from the bank, let's say 50 to 100 feet off the bank. That's going to be basically casting distance from the shoreline. Everything else that's more than a cast length away from the shoreline, so basically 100 feet away from the shoreline or more, is considered offshore. Now, I don't fish offshore out here in like 80 or 90 feet of water or 70 feet of water, except for in very specific situations. Most of the time I'm fishing offshore, but I'm not fishing in deep water. So that's one thing I want to make really clear to you guys. When I say offshore fishing, I don't mean fishing deep water. For example, one of my really good spots here on Lake Uchi is one of these points right here. And the top of this point that's probably 100 yards off the bank, maybe 80 yards off the bank, is only in 7 feet of water, but it's way out here in the middle. Basically, you have 7 foot of water, way off the bank. Here's another spot right here. 4 foot of water, way off the bank. These types of areas are basically the same depth as you have right up against the shoreline, except for that 4 foot of water is just not 
near any sort of objects or any sort of landmarks. You can't look at the shoreline to tell the water is shallow. You have to use a contour line map. So when I'm talking about offshore fishing, all I mean is that I'm fishing more than one cast length away from the bank. That's it. I could be technically fishing in four foot of water and still be fishing offshore if I'm more than a cast length away from the bank. Again, it doesn't mean when I say I'm fishing offshore that I'm having to fish in 30 or 40 or 50 feet of water. So I just want to clear that up. Now, that's really important because the main deal that, you know, the main thing about fishing shallow and offshore is that a lot of guys get confused of when they should fish offshore versus when they should fish shallow. And there's a lot of reasons for that, basically. But the main, there's like five main criteria that I go through when I go to the lake to determine if I'm going to fish shallow or I'm going to fish offshore. And this becomes easier or harder depending on the season of the year you're fishing. The most difficult time of year to make that decision is actually right now. And the reason I actually came up with the idea for this live stream is from a recent Bassmaster Open on Grand Lake. Let me pull my face over here. One second. There we go. Uh, It was a Bassmaster Open on Grand Lake. And it was won by Nick LeBrun. Nick LeBrun caught every single one of his fish in like a foot or two of water on a whopper plopper. He was fishing super shallow. He was spending his day, I'll show you where he was fishing on Grand Lake. And he basically was just going down the bank, throwing a whopper plopper. He was fishing out in front of the Shangri-La Marina here. He spent a lot of time fishing some of these pockets here um, on the midsection of the lake. I don't know why this is loading so slow, but like right in here, this midsection of the lake, in all these cuts, he was casting in behind boat docks, around boat docks. Just basically fishing right up against the shoreline. His bait was landing right on the bank, and he was getting his bites maybe no more than 20 or 30 feet off the bank on that whopper plopper. And he just threw it all tournament long and just did it the entire day. On a stark contrast, you have the second place finisher, which was Kenta Kimura. Kenta Kimura was basically fishing offshore the entire event. He caught a few fish up shallow, but the majority of his damage, especially on day one where he caught 21 pounds, 14 ounces, was done offshore. And he actually caught them on one of my really good spots on Grand Lake or one of several of my spots that I fish out there all the time. And I was actually talking to Randy about this tournament like a month before the cutoff. And actually, we were talking about where we catch them offshore. And I recommended the checkout the spot that Kenta caught 21 pounds the first day of that tournament, which is kind of crazy. And uh, I did it before the off limits and everything, guys. Don't worry. We we were keeping it legit. But basically what he was doing was throwing a uh, swing head or like a biffle bug. It was a Berkeley creature bait, but some sort of swing head. Then he was throwing a big magnum square bill. And then he had one other bait that's a bait from, uh, I think it was, oh, it's just another Berkeley creature bait for up shallow but mainly he was fishing offshore and the spots he was focused on were actually up here on this section of grand lake now again these are offshore areas but they're not necessarily the most offshore type areas you would expect to fish they're actually very shallow water areas and here's one of them i he kind of rotated several of these areas there's a bunch of rock piles up here but basically here's one rock pile you can see out here it's one foot of water, but it's a pretty good distance off the bank. If we actually we can actually measure this here in feet. So this spot out here is 558 feet off the bank. So really good distance off that bank. Not like we're sitting right up against the shore. So there's a big gap between the shoreline and this area, but it's only one foot of water up here. Another little section he was fishing is there's a couple rock piles right here. There's some rock piles out here. Basically, all these rock piles are in anywhere. There's several of them up and down this little stretch here. And it doesn't look like much on the map, but there's these big rock veins that stick out. And they're just isolated out here. And there's a bunch of them. I'm not going to give away the exact spot where every all the juice is going down. Uh, but close enough in this area. You guys can go find it if you want to. Um, but basically... He was fishing out here in, let's say, two to five feet of water, way off the bank. Both guys were actually catching their fish. Nick LeBrun and Kenta were catching their fish in the same exact depth of water, two to four feet. It's just that Kenta was catching them 200 yards off the shoreline, off the bank, while Nick LeBrun was catching them in two to four foot of water on steeper banks right next to the shoreline. The fish were in the exact same depth, but one guy was fishing shallow, one guy was fishing offshore. And that's something that 
you really have to uh, you really have to kind of gauge when you go to the lake. Should I be beating the bank like Nick was with the Whopper Popper? Should I be fishing offshore like Kenta was out here in the middle of the lake? And there's ways that you can catch them both ways, but there are definitely times when one is going to be better than the other. Now, as you guys know, I love offshore fishing. So my default is to fish offshore in areas like Kenta was fishing out here. I like to get away from the bank. I don't like to do patterns like what Nick was doing where he's just burning down the bank with a whopper plopper. That drives me crazy. I lose confidence if I don't get bit in like two hours. And sometimes you have to go three, four hours to make that happen. And sometimes you just don't land on the right school of fish. And that's what happened to uh, John Sukup, who actually is the owner of the Bass Tank, one of our sponsors. He caught them for the first two days of the tournament, 19 pounds and 15 pounds, caught really, really good bags of fish. And the last day... He basically said, he. I talked to him after the tournament, he just hit a bad rotation on the last day in terms of hitting the right banks at the right time. He was actually fishing a lot of the similar areas that Nick was with a buzz bait, but he tried a different area on the final day of the tournament to mix it up, and in that hour, hour and a half window when he was fishing in a different section of the lake, that's when Nick did most of his damage in the same exact spots, basically, that John was fishing, and it's just a little bit of a timing deal there, which is tricky. And that's the challenge I find a lot of times when I'm fishing, um, you know, shallow or offshore. It's a timing deal. But moreover, it's really important that you get yourself in that right type of water because obviously John and Nick were fishing in the exact same or pretty much a similar type of water. Cody Huff, who finished, uh, I think he finished fifth or sixth. I don't remember where he was at. He was fishing the exact same stretch as well as those guys. So they were in the right section of the lake and then Kenta kind of had the offshore deal all to himself so just kind of an interesting dynamic there and I talked to John about why he decided not to fish offshore and he felt like those fish were up in that two to four foot of water range and he had some fish that he did catch off the bank but he didn't feel like it was as consistent and Kenta was really the only guy that put it together offshore all three days and was able to get to that second place finish so what maybe made Kenta decide to go fish offshore versus beating the bank when should you decide to fish offshore versus fishing down the bank? And I want to kind of explain my thought process. I don't know if it's the right way to do it. This is just the way I do it. But, um, oh, one question from Jim. He says, why do my charts not look like yours? Uh, what you need to do, Jim, if you're on the Navionics web app here, let me pull up the bigger browser. If you're like on the actual big browser here, go down to the very bottom left corner and then don't do the Navionics map. The Navionics right here, this is just like the base map. If you then go to Sonar Chart, down here in the bottom left, click Sonar Chart, the map gets a lot more detailed. And this is just from user inputted data. So always do Sonar Charts. You can also enable this on your Fish Finder. You can enable the Sonar Chart settings. So yeah, that's super important um, right there. Okay, so why do I choose a fish shallow or offshore? Basically, the first indication there's five reasons why I make that decision. The first is how long I can actually fish. If I only have two to three hours to go out to the lake and fish, I normally don't choose to go fish offshore. As you guys have probably heard from some of my YouTube videos on my main YouTube channel, on average, it takes me about three hours to find a school of fish or a group of fish offshore. This means, let's say I launch my boat over here at Wolf Creek. I'm going to have to graph or drive my boat for a minimum of two and a half hours most days to find a group of fish. Or maybe not minimum, but on average, two and a half hours to find a group of fish. I may have to pull up and graph some main lake stuff, like some of these main lake humps out here. Maybe that's not the deal. Then I may have to move back further into some of these shallower flats back in here. Maybe they're two-thirds of the way back into a creek on a little hump back in here. Or maybe this whole section of the lake just isn't working, and I need to move to a new section of the lake. And I try all of this area here and don't find anything. And then I try all of this, and finally I narrow it down that this is the stretch that has schools of offshore fish. That whole process might take me two, two and a half hours if I don't land on the fish first try. Now, there are times when I land on them in the first 20 minutes. There's also times when I don't land on them for five hours. What that means is that if I'm going to try to catch enough fish to make it a good fishing day, if I'm fishing for two, three hours, I might never even find a group of fish before I have to put the boat back on the trailer and leave. Therefore, if I'm only able to fish for five hours or less, I don't try to fish offshore at all. If I only have basically less than five hours of fish in a fishing day, 
I do not try to catch offshore fish. It's not worth it. I don't have enough time to graph, find the fish, locate them, and then consistently catch the fish. There are exceptions to this rule, especially if I'm fishing in the middle of the summertime on lakes that I'm familiar with. So like, for example, Lake Uchi here. If I came out into Lake Uchi and I had four hours to fish, and I already knew where some schools of fish normally set up because of past experience, or if I had been out there the week before and I knew that the fish were, for example, on this ledge, then definitely I would go and fish offshore. But if I had no idea where the fish were, I was just going out there just to find them and figure it out. I'm not going to choose to fish offshore if I only have four hours to fish. Now, if I have five, six, seven, or eight hours, then yeah, normally I'll be able to find at least one group of fish, hopefully two in a five to six hour day, and it makes it worth fishing offshore for me. What this means is that if you're going out for a three hour night tournament and you haven't found any offshore fish in practice or don't know what you're doing out there offshore, it's probably best to just pick up a buzz bait, beat the bank, throw a square bill, something like that. You're going to have a lot more success because you're able to visibly see the areas that are looking good. If you pull up Google Earth, for example, here, and I just show you here, it's much easier to go to Grand Lake, for example, with three hours of fishing and just be able to run down the banks and look for obvious pieces of cover or structure that might hold fish. For example, we have a nice rocky point right here. This looks like a good obvious area that you can catch fish on. We have some boat docks right here, a good potential area. You have a, maybe a steeper chunk rock bank right here. This is something you can visibly see with your eyes. Maybe a seawall, so on and so forth. All of these areas are visible to the naked eye when you're driving down the lake. It allows you to quickly determine where and what you're fishing. When you're offshore though, let's say we're over here in these areas where Kento is catching them, you have no idea what's going on out here. It's just a bunch of nothing. And the spots that he's catching them are like way out here, for example. So how do you know what's down there? Well, you don't unless you have prior knowledge or if you could take the time to actually go graph. And this is kind of what's down there on the bottom. You have a lot of stuff like this. It's these big rocky veins where you have nothing and then boom, there's rock. But to find that, you have to spend time graphing with side imaging, down imaging to locate those areas. And that just takes time. It's not going It's not going to be very uh, helpful if you only have two hours to go find those. And not every single rocky patch is going to have fish on them. You're going to have to find multiple rocky patches or find multiple um, brush piles until you find one that has fish on it. It's much easier then to just roll down the bank here and fish visible rocky banks. And maybe you can fish 10 visible rocky banks in an hour or in maybe an hour and a half where it might take you two to three hours to find 10 offshore rocky spots with your electronics and you haven't even fished yet so that's the reason why i don't fish offshore if i only have uh, or if i have less than five hours to fish on a fishing day so that's the first criteria the second is is my lake rising or is my lake falling that's a very important de determining factor for me on any lake in the country if i'm going to fish shallow or offshore in general, what you'll find is that when a lake is rising, and I'm just going to use Google Earth here to illustrate when lakes are rising and falling. So let's say that, uh, let me find a point in time. Here we go. This is a perfect example. Uh, so we got this, these points and stuff right here. This, this bank right here. This bank right now is pretty low. You can see a lot of the trees and bushes are out of the water. And now we have an example here where the lake is very high. This is where the bushes are flooded and there's all kinds of good stuff in there. I'm going to move my head again because now it's in the way this way. Um, so this is kind of the flooded cover that you could be fishing when the lake is rising. Whenever that lake is rising from lower water conditions like this and getting higher, it's raising up into those bushes, that's going to push a lot of extra water into those bushes, which knocks free any living organisms, uh, little bugs, uh, plankton, things like that, little uh, microorganisms that the bait fish love to feed on. And it's going to create a very rich environment for those bait fish. And what will happen is the bait fish and, you know, the perch, bluegill, shad, they're going to rush to this newly flooded cover to feed on all of that new nutrients in the water. And the bass are going to follow them. And this will last for two, three, four days where all of that living organisms and all that stuff are still alive in these trees for a few days after that water rises up. However, 
after the war is in the bushes for, let's say, four, five, six days, the new nutrients have probably been already used up by the bait fish and stuff like that, those fresh nutrients. And while the bass may stay, may still stay in here, they may not just like live in there the rest of the summer. They may actually start moving out as those nutrients get depleted. But in those first three, four days, as that water is rising up, you're going to have a surge of fish moving up into the shallow water. Whether it's summer, winter, it doesn't matter. Water temperatures could be 45 degrees in the winter, or they could be 90 degrees in the summer. And if that water rises two, three feet really quickly, those fish will go to that newly flooded cover. Now, on the flip side, if that water was high and now it starts to fall, or if it was already kind of at normal pool and it falls even further past that to a lower pool, this is usually going to pull more fish away from shallow cover and offshore. And if the lake is falling, even if it's currently flooded, but it's flooded and falling, let's say a half a foot a day or a quarter of a foot a day, I will choose to fish offshore in those situations, even on these flooded lakes. That's just because as that water starts to pull out, there's going to be a group of fish that actually move away from the bank, get back out into offshore areas, and they're going to be catchable, usually away from the bank. Again, even if that lake is five or six feet high. So that's another determining factor for me. Is the lake rising or falling? If it's rising, I fish shallow. If it's falling, I usually try to fish offshore. The third determining factor is fishing pressure. So fishing pressure is really important in terms of where the majority of the anglers in the lake are actually fishing. So for example, if we take a look at this flooded lake conditions on Grand Lake, I know if the lake is flooded, there's probably going to be a lot of guys fishing up shallow in the flooded cover. Now there's a lot of flooded cover to fish, so there's probably enough to go around. But usually if all the other anglers are up here fishing shallow, and I notice everyone's up there shallow, I'm going to try to find some offshore areas just because those fish are going to be getting so much less fishing pressure. Fishing pressure has such a negative impact on fish. And you see this in tournaments especially. You can whack them in practice the day before or you know the week before a tournament gets there. Then as soon as 150 anglers start fishing on that lake, those fish get locked jaw and they're a lot harder to catch. Well, if 90% of the anglers are fishing down these flooded trees and stuff up against the bank, maybe even 95%, that means that only 5% of the anglers are actually fishing offshore. And if you can find a school of fish offshore, they're going to be untouched, they're not going to have seen a bait in a while, and they're just going to bite so much easier. They might be harder to find, but if you find them, it's not like you're going to have to work for them. You don't need to wait for a feeding window or anything. You can just catch them. And that's really, really cool. This happens a lot as well in the springtime when you have guys moving up really fast to the banks in the spring. The Shan Lake, like Grand Lake, a lot of guys, when it gets to be February and March, they make a beeline for these pockets and these points on these main lake um, pockets, and they'll just fish shallow with a crankbait, a spinnerbait, stuff like that. And they basically abandon those offshore areas. Again, it's mainly because most of the fish have started migrating towards the banks, but there are going to be a percentage of bass that are still living offshore. They might not be deep, they might only be in three or four foot of water, but they might be off the bank. And a good example of this is actually over in this area. Here's a little rocky spot that's not deep. It's only like two foot of water when the lake is at normal pool. You can see this right here, and then when it's up, you can see it's completely gone. But that little rocky spot right there, that could be a place that a group of fish sets up on that's in two foot of water, And everyone else is just fishing down these banks, fishing down these bushes. And you can just be a cast off the bank and hammering them because literally guys are going over them with their boat. They're not casting at them. So that's really, really important fishing pressure. And another thing that happens is in the the spawn and like near the end of the spring or the end of the spawning cycle, a lot of guys are still going to be up in the shallow pockets and shallow coves because water temperatures are still in the 70 degree range. Maybe there's still some late spawning fish, a lot of post-spawn fish. And in that situation, a lot of guys are still up shallow. Maybe 80 to 90% of the anglers are up shallow. That's again when I'll pull back offshore before everyone else does because it's going to help me catch those fish that are less pressured. Now, the complete opposite can also be true. Sometimes you can get out here, guys, and it can be absolutely mayhem offshore. And I've had days, especially more recently, where there's so many anglers fishing offshore that every single good ledge or hump 
is, has a boat on it, or it's been fished two or three times that day. In that situation, it's very hard to actually catch fish offshore. And I actually remember uh, fishing on Lake Dardanelle for a college fishing, or I fished this high school fishing world finals four years in a row. And there were like 250 boats in those tournaments, and I finished in the top 10 every single year at a second, I think a third, a fifth, and a tenth, or something like that. Uh, in this tournament, and I never caught my fish in the same place twice on Lake Dardanelle, and it's because it was really funny, because what would happen is the first year I fished it, everyone was fishing offshore, down here uh, in the Illinois Bayou, the offshore guys were going crazy, and it was just impossible to find any good offshore spots that weren't getting hammered by everyone, so I basically ignored that, ran way up the river, and fished lily pads in like two foot of water, and because everyone was fascinated about catching them offshore, because that's where all the tournaments had been won that year, we are kind of fishing at the tail end of the summer, so word got around that the offshore bite was good, and basically, I was able to catch them up here in lily pads in two foot of water when everyone else was fishing offshore. The next year, everyone struggled catching them offshore, so everyone else the year before was catching them up shallow, so then the next year everybody in the entire tournament fished up shallow, and there was nobody fishing offshore. So I was over here in Delaware Bay, and there literally wasn't another boat that fished around me the entire tournament, and we finished uh, fifth in that tournament fishing offshore because no one else was out here. Next year, it flip-flopped again. The offshore bite was good, so everyone went offshore. I was fishing the backs of creeks way back in the back of creeks back in here, just because all the offshore stuff was covered up and then it flip-flopped the next year and I, I finished second fishing offshore. So it, it flip-flops, flip flop flip flop That's just how it goes on these, these deals and it can usually be seasonal. Sometimes it's just what's popular on your lake, but I always try to do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. If everyone's fishing offshore, I fish shallow. If everyone's fishing shallow, I fish offshore. That's how I've always done it and it's worked well for me. You guys see me fishing offshore more than not nowadays just because that's what... Um, you guys like to see on my YouTube channel, but I'm about to start changing up a little bit and doing a good mix of shallow and offshore in my Catch 15 challenges. Basically, I'm going to be doing, uh, I'm going to go out to the lake and I'm just going to make the determination morning of with these rules, should I fish shallow, should I fish offshore, and I'm going to stick with that one pattern all day. And I'm probably going to choose offshore more than not because I love fishing offshore and that's what I like to do, but there are going to be days where I'm going to have to fish up shallow for sure. The next rule of thumb that is really important and is not talked about near enough is where are the largemouth? On my lakes, especially here in kind of the Northwest Arkansas area, largemouth are king if you're going to try to do well in tournaments or catch like a 15 pound limit, which is what I do in all my challenges. And especially when you're on lakes that are deeper and clearer and have a mixed species of fish. This doesn't work on all lakes like Lake Darnell, you're only fishing for largemouth. Primarily, there's some spotted bass, but uh, mainly largemouth. But if you're on a lake, for example, like a Greer's Ferry Lake. Greer's Ferry Lake over here in Arkansas is a tricky little lake. There's a lot of spotted bass, a lot of smallmouth, and largemouth. So you have all three species. And whenever I am fishing in a tournament trying to catch 15 pounds, my goal is to determine where are the largemouth. Because that's what's going to get you a check. That's what's going to help you win most tournaments on these lakes. Now, Grouse Ferry has been off in recent years, and you can catch 12 pounds of smallmouth and win. But back when I was fishing it uh, for tournaments and stuff like 10 years ago, you could catch largemouth. And basically what I deter- made the determination of is, first up, where are the largemouth? And then I determine if I'm fishing shallow or offshore. And this happens as well on Beaver Lake as well. So I'll kind of give you two examples of how this happens. So if I come over here, I um, don't know what those are. Uh, if we come over here to Gurus Ferry, basically I found in general that if I'm going to catch largemouth, uh, oh sorry, I'm not on Google Earth, I do this all the time. If I'm not, uh, if I'm trying to catch largemouth on Gurus Ferry Lake, in most cases I'm going to probably be focused more on the upper third of this lake where you have more dirty water. So I back up in here or back up in these river arms up here or up in here. That's where you find a big, bigger population of the largemouth. So that's where I'll focus. And given that, I'm fishing in a little bit more stained water. Let's say a foot to four foot of visibility versus 10 foot of visibility down here. Now, I've caught fish, really good fish, good smallmouth. And there's times when they can catch largemouth and smallmouth mixed in this clear water. And I've done that before. But in general, 
you're going to find that you're going to be more consistent with the largemouth up in the dirtier water. So if I'm up here in this area, for example, and I know I need to catch some largemouth, I'm going to determine where do I think those largemouth are going to be. If it's the summertime, there's a pretty good chance those largemouth are going to be positioned more offshore. And there's some offshore road beds, and some channel swing drops and stuff out here that are really good. And I might choose to fish offshore. If I'm up here and the water is really muddy, it's warm, but it's like warming up in the 50 degree range, you might be able to catch a lot of good fish throwing a spinner bait down some of these steeper banks around these boat docks and you know up on some of these you know steeper banks leading into cuts. And that's where I'll feel like the largemouth are going to be. And I really base my decision on shallow or offshore on where those largemouth are going to be positioning. It has a lot to do with water clarity, water visibility. It's not, it's a little, that's a little more nuanced and I'm not going to be able to get into all of it right now, but that's definitely something to take a look at. And the same thing happens when you're over here on like a beaver lake. I'm actually going to do a catch 15 on uh, beaver here very soon in the next couple of months or next couple of weeks. And I'm going to do a whole breakdown of how I'm going to decide how to fish. But overall, the high level in the springtime i know i can usually come up here and catch some good largemouth up on these steeper rocky banks when the wind is blowing so if the wind is blowing and i feel like those largemouth are going to be pulling up on some of these steeper bluffy banks i'm going to run up here and fish up shallow however if i get a bright sunny day with no wind and nothing going on usually those largemouth are not going to pull up in that shallower water Instead, they're going to be more suspended. And so what I'll do is I'll actually fish offshore in standing timber with a jerk bait to catch those fish because they're, the wind and the conditions are not pushing those largemouth up against those shallow, uh, bluffy banks. Instead, they're going to be in this, I know shallow bluffy is kind of a contradiction, but the shoreline bluffs, instead, they're going to be pulled off maybe, um, just to give you guys like an idea of what I'm talking about, they may pull up into one of these guts or something. Um, where there's a, uh, like, see right here, there's like these offshore standing timber trees and there's trees all out here. So I might put my boat way offshore and cast a jerk bait around some of these trees or fish a jig through these trees in these little guts and pockets off the bank when it's sunny. And then if I was, again, if it's windy and cloudy, I'm getting on these steeper rocky bluffs, throwing like a swim bait or a rock crawler crankbait, something like that. So that's kind of how I make that decision in those cases. It's a little more nuanced. It's not as obvious. That's why I kind of left that more to the end. That's more on instinct than on uh, like experience than hard, fast rules. And then the last rule of thumb is probably the most important and the one that is the least uh, scientific or the, le <laughs> the least uh, explainable. And that's where do I feel the most comfortable? This plays a lot especially when I'm fishing lakes, one that I'm familiar with, or if I'm going to a brand new lake I've never been to. So it can play in both ways. But let's say, for example, I came over here and I just am going to pull up a random lake over here, like Lake Texoma. Never fished Lake Texoma in my life. And if I was going to fish Lake Texoma tomorrow, I have no idea if I'm going to fish shallow or if I'm going to fish offshore. I would have to do some research. And again, I'll show you guys how I actually make all these decisions in future live streams. I'll actually break it down for you guys with what I'm doing. But in general, what I would look for on Lake Texoma is probably pull up some sort of Google Earth map and look at a section of the lake where I feel the most comfortable. And for me, if I'm just going to do a quick overview of this lake, where do I feel like I look? I feel the most comfortable? Probably, probably this section up here to me just looks a, very similar to some of the lakes that I fish in Arkansas. You got these flatter tapering banks like this. You have like, see there's like a little rocky thing right there. It looks kind of interesting. Um, you got some steeper banks leading in. So I'm going to pick a section of the lake where I feel comfortable. And then when I get in there and let's say I'm fishing there in, oh, sorry guys, I'm not showing you on Google earth. I keep doing this. This is what happens when I do, um, uh, this is what I, this is what happens when I'm doing this by myself. But basically, I pull up Texelma and I was saying this area of the lake looks the most similar to my lakes. And when I get in here, if I get in here and I feel like, oh, I fished a day on Beaver Lake where I caught them offshore really well and it was sunny and I was catching them on little offshore rocky spots, I'll probably choose to fish offshore that day because it's a pattern that was familiar to me and I have confidence. If I go in here and, for example, 
I see that there's a bunch of these laydowns and stuff. These might hold fish, but I've never caught fish in my life fishing laydowns like this on banks consistently. Like I've done it before, obviously randomly, but I've never like consistently developed a pattern. So just because this the conditions like the water's rising and stuff like that, and it tells me, oh, I need to fish shallow. I may not just go randomly fishing up here on these laydowns. I may still choose to fish offshore if that's the only available cover because I just don't feel comfortable fishing that type of cover. Now, there's obviously other stuff I could fish, and so maybe that's not the best example, but really what I'm going to focus on is fishing what I'm comfortable with on that day, what feels right in my gut. And again, that's not a very um, scientific, I know that's very wishy-washy, but that's the best I can say is if I feel comfortable, if I feel like, man, I, I have some confidence going in starting this pattern, that's important. If I see something and I'm like, or I try to go fish some way and I'm like, I have no idea how to do this. I've never caught fish like this in my life. I'm super conflicted about what I'm doing. Normally not a good recipe for success. That's a great way to learn and you may have to go through several of those days to learn a new pattern. But personally, I feel like I've fished enough now on these different bodies of water that if I'm getting that feeling, it's not great for me because I feel like I have enough experience now from the years that I can find something that is confidence building in this area of the lake, whether it's shallow or offshore, and I'm going to start there. I need to, I need to find a pattern that I'm initially confident in before I do anything else. So hopefully that makes any sense um, to you guys. I know it was wishy-washy. Andrew says... Uh, can you elaborate on your research? Yeah, Andrew, I'm going to do that in a full other stream. That's a whole other concept. And I'll show you how I research uh, local tournaments, um, all kinds of map studies, stuff like that to make my determination of how and where I'm going to fish. And I'll do that on some of the lakes coming up here that I'm going to do my Catch 15 challenges on. I'm going to break down my uh, fishing day before I even go out there to show you how I prepare. Then you'll actually see the full YouTube video of what I actually do on the water for that Catch 15 challenge. Awesome. Okay, so that is that, guys. Um, I want to take a pivot here, and I have a whole um, chart in PowerPoint, and I have a whole other thing that I really want to get your interaction in here uh, in just a second. And actually, let me give you a sneak peek of what that looks like, because I think you're going to really like it. Or maybe you won't. I don't know. This is what I'm going to be talking about here in just a second. So I have this whole chart here of jigs and crankbaits. And I want to throw a crazy idea at you guys, and you'll understand what this means here in a second, but I need your input on this because this is something that is not super, I haven't fleshed out this whole concept very well, so I want to get your opinion on it. But before we do that, got a couple things that we have to take care of, some housekeeping tips. Um, so first, we got to announce our winner for our case of Bridgeford beef jerky. Last week we did our live stream, actually two weeks ago at this point, where we broke down how much money professional anglers make. I know the analysis wasn't perfect. Some guys were kind of nitpicking and I apologize that I didn't go super in depth on that. I didn't have time to dive down into all the tax codes by every angler state and stuff like that. But I tried my best. So um, you can check that live stream out if you missed it. But from last week we had a bunch of people giving comments um, that I thought were really interesting, that were really good. The one that I picked to win the case of Bridge for Beef Jerky this past week was Living Missouri's Outdoor. Uh, basically, the comment was that it's all about reaching the inevitable goal, the thrill of winning, the drive to perfection. We all know money is the root of all evil, but money controls all aspects of life in every sport, all things we do. And basically, are NFL quarterbacks really worth hundreds of millions of dollars? Uh, he said, fishing is heading towards NASCAR collapsing, uh, never because fishermen control the industry. So basically trying to say that, you know, it's, it's, if you want to reach that inevitable goal of fishing, the thrill of winning, it can definitely be worth it and that drive to get there. But you have to have that in your heart if you want to be a really good professional angler. And I fully believe that economically, it may not be the best career path if you want to make a consistent income maybe just getting a corporate job getting your uh, business degree getting your MBA and then getting the corporate definitely can make you a better living but if you have that passion that drive to really make it in the sport and love fishing and do that for a living there are ways to do it so definitely a really good message there so living Missouri outdoors just send me an email over at info at fishmoment.com and I'll send you a free case of Bridgeford beef jerky so really like that 
Um, next up, I uh, just want to do another quick shout out here. Got all of our shout outs, guys. Sorry for so many shout outs, uh, but we got our sponsors that we have to take care of. They support the podcast every single week, and our sponsor is the Bass Tank. So uh, the Bass Tank, they you know support the podcast every single week, and they're the number one bass fishing electronics installation companies in the country. And just like we talked about uh, earlier in the stream, John Sukup, the owner of the Bass Tank, was actually leading the Bassmaster Open. He's been on a tear this year. And it's really cool because the guys who are at the Bass Tank are all fishermen. I talk fishing with them all the time. They actually use electronics on the water to catch bass, to catch crappie, things like that. They don't just have like the basics of installation down. They know how to use the electronics to actually catch fish. And that's really the main reason I trust them to rig up my boat with all my electronics. So if you guys are interested in getting electronics rigged up the right way, definitely head over to the Bass Tank. If you have any new fish finder needs, you can purchase the fish finders from them, get uh, support from them, and also get them installed the right way so that you can actually use them to catch more fish. Some guys install the fish finders in crazy ways and they don't actually... I feel like a lot of guys that install them don't know how to actually use the fish finders themselves, so they install them in these wacky, weird ways that are not appropriate for the type of fishing that you're doing. So definitely check them out over in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or just give them a call right here, or just check them out at thebasstank.com. One more thing, sorry, I forgot to mention the um, giveaway for this week. So Bridgeford, again, our other sponsor, we're going to have to do a Bridgeford beef jerky giveaway. Sorry, Randy's not here, so I'll have a moment to collect my thoughts. Normally, while he's talking, I can get prepared for the next segment, but right now I'm flying solo, so I feel like I just have to keep talking to keep it up. But this week for our Bridgeford Beef Jerky giveaway, I want you guys to leave a comment about the next segment of this live stream, about my whole crankbait jig philosophy that I'm about to throw out. Let me know, your, give me some feedback on this theory I'm about to give you. You don't know about it yet, but you're about to hear about it. If you leave a comment down below in the description of this video, you'll have a chance to enter in to win a free case of Bridgeford Beef Jerky. Again, Living Missouri Outdoors, send me an email, uh, infofishmoment.com, to get your free case of beef jerky. Okay, done. We got all the sponsor stuff out of the way. Now let's get back to this deal. Let me pull this all back up. Okay. So here is my crazy deal that I'm gonna I'm gonna shrink my face a little bit. So I oh I'm really small. Okay, I don't know where I'm gonna put myself. Um, I'll just throw myself over here for just a second, and then we'll we'll move myself around. That's fine. Okay, so you're probably like, what is what is this, Johnny? What are you doing here? Okay, so let me explain. Basically. I've been looking at my videos recently, and I've been doing these Catch-15 challenges now since, like, April. In every single challenge, when I catch 15 pounds of fish, all of my bait, all of my bites come on two baits. A jig or a crankbait. That's it. And I have some data from the past that, uh, let me pull it up here really quick. Let me pull this up. I have some data on my personal fishing trips that is really interesting and I don't know if I have my statistics. Here it is. Let me pull this up. So this is basically what I found. I did a video a while back called the Big Bass Index and I looked at my all year round and you can check out this video on my YouTube channel. It's Big Bass Index uh, I basically took all my fish catches over the course of the entire year, categorized them, created this uh, this index that allows me to see which baits produce bigger fish on average for me. You'll have to watch the video to understand it. It's kind of confusing it's just looking at this chart. But basically, my top two baits in that were a deep diving crankbait and a football jig. And overall, I was just looking back at five years of data, and I keep all my data and stuff, and I'm not going to show it all here because it's too much to get into. But basically... Most of my fish, over 50% of all of my fish, over three pounds that I catch year round come on a, either a jig or a crankbait. Whether it's a deep diving crankbait, a shallow diving crankbait, doesn't really matter. Something about jigs and crankbaits, whether it's regionally in my area or it's just a really good bait overall, produce better than average fish for me, both shallow and offshore. Again, I think it's a little bit to do with the fact that I'm over here in Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma. There's a lot of good jig and crankbait water in this area, but... You know, and those baits might be different for you. For example, if you're fishing up north, maybe a drop shot for the smallmouth is going to be a staple, and then maybe 
um, a chatterbait in some of the grass lakes. Or maybe if you're down in Texas, maybe the chatterbait's going to be really good and a big swim bait or whatever it is. It's probably regional, but for me personally, what I'm thinking about is there's probably something to this jig crankbait phenomenon. I'm seeing it across five years of data, across this years of data, also looking at my Bassmaster Elite Series statistics I've gathered, and from my small, small sample size of these Catch 15 videos I've been doing where I catch all of my fish over three pounds basically on jigs and crankbaits. So I was kind of thinking, I was like, okay, is it possible to only fish jigs and crankbaits year-round in every single situation? If I had to just throw a jig and a crankbait, that's it. Is that possible? And would that actually make my fishing easier? Because if you think about it, there's so many baits you have to fish on a day-to-day basis or learn to become a successful fisherman or quote-unquote successful fisherman. I don't know if that's actually true. But let's just pull up Tackle Warehouse here really quick. Um, I'm just going to get this pulled up. So if we have Tackle Warehouse, let's just let's just go through the baits. So if we go through here, we got hard baits. Okay, we got a lot of different crankbaits. We got spoons. We got jigging spoons. We got underspins. We have jigs, which is obviously there's a lot of different jigs. But then you also have your frogs. You have your uh, all of your swim baits. There's a lot of different swim baits, whether it's glide baits, paddle tails, soft swim baits. You have your spinner baits, and there's a lot of different varieties of spinner baits. You have your chatter baits. You have buzz baits. You have topwater walking baits. So many varieties of baits out there, not even getting into the billions of creature baits that are out there, all the worms, the tubes, the finesse worms, everything. It's super overwhelming, especially if you're trying to go out and also think about the other important factors of fishing, like the contour lines on the map, the weather conditions, the uh, current flow, all these things. And I feel like I'm cluttering up my brain too much thinking about which fishing lures to throw when I probably could just be focused on throwing a jig and a crankbait and then really dialing in my brain, using my brain power to think about where the fish are positioning, look at the current, the sun angle, stuff like that. And if I focus more on those sorts of small factors that other people ignore and limit my bait choice, I might be a more successful fisherman. And then finally, given my recent data, from this past year and then also my all of my trips recently over my Catch-15 videos showing that jigs and crankbaits are successful, maybe just isolating myself to fishing jigs and crankbaits exclusively, keeping that variable constant, and then basically focusing on all the other millions of factors, I might become a better fisherman. That's my working theory. I don't know if that is something that is going to work, but hopefully that is an idea that we can go for. So how am I going to do this? Basically, my idea, this is just an idea, so don't think this is like a perfect theory. This is, I'm literally just spitballing here. I came up with this just recently, and I want to get your guys' opinion in the chat. But what I've found is, you know, what the way I think about it is that you can basically break up all baits into three different categories in my mind. You have a power version, a finesse version, and a suspended version. Your power version is a bait that you're going to power fish with. You know, when the fish are active, they're aggressive. Maybe it's a bigger bait. It's going to get a bigger bite. Uh, Fished in different ways. Usually fished on the bottom, though. Your power baits are going to be fished on the bottom or making contact with some sort of cover. Your finesse baits are going to be baits where it's post front conditions, bluebird skies. Fishing is tough. These are your more finesse baits. um, Going to be a little bit harder to actually get bit. So that's where you want to go. Finally, you have your suspended baits. These are baits that are fished in the middle of the water column when those bass are actually suspended. And what I basically did here is I broke up my jigs, all the jigs that I throw, by the style and also by the depth of water that I would plan to fish them in. This way, I can have one jig for every single scenario I could face on the lake. So for example, we have a power, power bait. I need a bait if the fishing is good, the conditions are good, maybe the fish are really aggressive, I need a, a, a power moving bait or a, a aggressive jig to fish in zero to three feet of water. For me, that's going to be an 11 16 ounce jewel tactical flipping jig. A heavy jig flipping it up their shallow in zero to three foot of water, it's going to fly by their face and it's going to get some good bites if they're there. 
Next, let's say they're in four to seven foot of water. This is where I'll go to a swing head. It's not technically a jig, but it is kind of a jig in a way. It's got a football head with a creature bait on the back. That's the only like non-jig on this list. So it's kind of a little bit of a uh, cheating, but it's good enough. It's just a category there. Next, we have 8 to 15 feet in the power. We have a fish moment offshore jig. You guys know I love my football jig. I designed for jewel baits. Works really, really well. I spelled ounce wrong, uh, but that is just the way it goes. And uh, that's going to be from basically 8 all the way to 30 feet of water. And then from 31 feet on, I have this locally made jig called a Bass X jig. It's a one ounce football jig that I'll throw in 30 plus feet of water. Next, we have the finesse approaches. Let me just get my face cam out of here because this is just clogging up space. My finesse approaches here are basically baits that are worked in the exact same depth, zero to three feet, all the way down to 30 feet, but they're going to be fished on lighter line when the fish are less aggressive. For me, a really good finesse jig when I really want to get in tight cover, especially like zero to three foot of water, is this Jewel Tactical Finesse HG, HD jig. It has a really stout flipping hook, basically the same hook that's in this uh, jewel tactical flipping jig, but it has a 316 sounds weight to it and a finesse skirt. This bait will get a lot more bites than this heavy flipping jig because it's lighter and has a smaller profile. It's better when those fish are a little bit less aggressive. In that four to eight foot, four to seven foot zone, I really like to drag a little 38 ounce uh, football jig, but it has a finesse skirt on it. I also was thinking about putting a shaky head in here. I, I may actually take that out and switch that for a shaky head in the future. I didn't want to go too much with the <laughs> with going away, but probably I would actually remove that and I would probably put a shaky head, a black zoom trick worm. That's probably what I would put there, honestly, now that I'm going through this, uh, just because I feel like that might be the better bait. I don't know if that's actually true or not. But let me see here. I'm going to try to find a picture of that really quick. I don't know if I actually have one on hand. I probably do. I don't know where they are. Um, let's see here. Oh, yeah, I got one right here. Okay, let me grab. I'm just going to grab a little shaky head just to throw it in there because why not? I want to be consistent. This is not matching my colors. This is not a uh, pretty PowerPoint right now, guys. This is what we're doing. And I'm just doing this just because I want to roll through. And I'm just going to explain this, and I want to get your input here in a second, but let me just crop this. Crop. There we go. Okay. So now i got a shaky head. I think that black zoom trick worm or just a zoom trick worm on a quarter ounce head. Quarter ounce shaky head. Okay. That's probably what I would throw there. It's not really a jig, but it's kind of in line with my four to seven foot. Four to seven foot range is kind of a weird, like offshore, kind of shallow-ish range. And the swing head and that shaky head are just really good baits that I have a lot of confidence in. So these are not jigs, but they are close enough for me. Then for the eight to 15 foot zone, basically have my peewee football jig from Jewel. It's a micro tiny jig. It's like the size of like a, uh, like a peanut. It's tiny. And the 516 size for 8 to 15 feet and then a 716 size basically almost half an ounce for 16 to 30 feet of water and I'll fish this thing on 6 to 8 pound fluorocarbon line on a spinning rod just a little it's basically like a Ned rig but it's a jig and it gets a little bit better quality for me than the Ned rig uh, but it works really really well when those fish are not aggressive and then finally we have our suspended jigs and when I say suspended I mean it's worked kind of in the middle of the water column for zero to three feet and four to seven feet, I'm basically throwing a striking hack attack heavy cover swim jig, whether that's a three eighths ounce or a half ounce, depending on the water depth. I'm usually fishing this over grass, around shallow water willow grass, where I'm working it, you know, a couple feet under the surface, just kind of working it through the water column. It's kind of like a spinner bait in a way for me, but it's a little bit less flashy. From 8 to 15 feet, one of my sneaky lures that I haven't really made a video about, but I catch a lot of fish on, uh, is this Megabass Uozo Swimmer, or Uoze Swimmer. It's a three-quarter ounce swim jig with an underspin on it, and it works great swimming over the top of brush piles and over the top of standing timber, and it catches some big fish. So that's another good suspended bait. And then when those fish are really suspended off the bottom, especially offshore in 16 to however deep, I basically throw a hair jig, and this is a Cumberland Pro half ounce hair jig. 
it kind of works as like a flutter spoon for me. It actually even works like a swim bait. I can basically use this Uozo swimmer swim jig and this hair jig to cover all my swim jig or uh, swim bait needs. Now I might even put a swim jig or uh, sorry, a swim bait trailer like a Kai Tech or a Spark Shad, Mega Best Spark Shad on the back of this um, swim jig. And then on this, I just, uh, hair jig, I just leave it as is and fish it like that. But this basically covers every single scenario from zero feet to 50 feet in all three styles. And that's still quite a few baits if you really think about it. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight, nine, ten different baits just in jigs. So really think about that. Really think about the fact that I tried to cover every single scenario for jig fishing with this table, and I still have to carry ten different varieties of baits, probably in a variety of colors. I'm going to have to probably carry, at the minimum for me for jigs, I'm throwing a green pumpkin and a black and blue. And then maybe for my swim jigs, I might have a white. For my hair jigs, I usually just have a white version. Maybe for my Uozo Swimmer, I might have a black and blue, a white, and a green pumpkin to imitate bluegill. So you're dealing with quite a few colors in all of this, and you have basically 10 baits in two colors a piece. That's 20 different baits that you have to carry around. That's a lot of baits right there, and making decisions between those, that's already kind of getting a lot of, uh, using a lot of mental capacity that may be used better in other scenarios. So... This is kind of my thought process here. I want to get your opinion on this because I know over here in the comments, people I'm talking, I'm going to read through all this. And I'm just going to, I want to get your opinion and maybe let me know if there's something you disagree with. Maybe there's a bait that I'm missing. Maybe the there's something better to put in one of these boxes. Let me know because I think, I think I'm pretty close here, but I don't know if this is perfect. So let me just read through some of these comments um, and just let me know. Um, what you guys think. Let's see here. Someone's saying they don't catch anything on jigs or crankbaits. Um, uh, Cameron says, I was kind of thinking about my biggest uh, fish have come on jigs and crankbaits. This is very smart. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, the only issue is grassy lakes. Crankbaits are rough. Yeah, that's the tricky part. I don't have a lot of grass in my area. So maybe, a, I mean, I know I catch fish on my football jig in grassy lakes, and I catch them with the um, swim jigs, obviously. Lipless crankbaits are great coming through grass. You may have to add a bladed jig, like a chatterbait, into this mix. Maybe if you were on grass lakes, maybe take off one of these swim jigs or one of these swimmer, what was a swimmer, and add a chatterbait instead. It's basically a jig with a blade on the front. I guess everything is a jig with a blade on the front, like a spinnerbait's that, a buzzbait, but maybe we could bend the rules a little bit and put like a chatterbait in here as opposed to a swim jig in one of these. And that may be a good alteration to make, maybe in this like uh, somewhere in here especially if you're on grass lakes. I don't like throwing chatterbaits that much unless I'm around grass. Sometimes I'll fish them around boat docks and stuff because you can skip them. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I, I may need to put a, some sort of chatterbait in here. I'm not a, not 100% sure. Um, let's see here. Ryan says, simplifying bait selection, more focus on the water conditions map study. Yes, please. What kind of trailers would you pair with it? So that's a great question. So really, um, this is something I've been working on for a while. Let me pull up. Um, so with my trailers, I have I actually designed a trailer for Jewel Bait Company that's literally, um, if you go here to Tackle Warehouse and you type in Versa Craw, this is the trailer I designed for Jewel Bait Company to be the most versatile jig trailer on the market. It's basically a uh, chunk trailer that you can break apart all these little gateways. And you can basically break it apart just here in the center like this. And you get kind of like a, a chunk style trailer. If you break it right down the center, you can take out the inner tails. So you get this sort of like twin tail grub. You can take the outer tails off and you get more of this finesse style trailer. And you can basically throw this one trailer for everything. You don't need any other trailer other than this. Other than for the swim jig, you may want to have like a paddle tail swim bait uh, just for that Uozo swimmer swim jig. But everything else, you can just throw this Versacraw. And right now, 
we just have on Tackle Warehouse the junior size and the peewee size. The junior size and the peewee size, those work great basically on uh, your football jigs, your finesse jigs, all these peewee jigs, even like your swim jigs. But we do have a senior size coming out that's going to be bigger and it's going to work great as a, I mean, it works absolutely perfect on a swing head. It works great as a bigger trailer on this big flipping jig. Even like on this bigger one ounce jig, it works great. And you can also use it as a really aggressive swim jig trailer. So we're going to get that senior size out here at some point. Uh, I don't know exactly when, when the plan is to get that out. Uh, it might might just be a jewel bait release only on the their website for now. We have some packaging issues and stuff we have to handle. But this is currently sold out right here actually in Tackle Warehouse. Um, good sign. But the junior size is the size I use on my football jigs and a lot of jigs. It's a perfect size. You can also just go to jewelbait.com and get them. So let me um, let me pull Google Earth up here. I just need to pull this up. Jewelbait dot com just give me a second i'm i'm doing something off screen i just don't want anything to pull up that's not supposed to um let's see here okay here we go so if you guys go to jewelbait.com and then just go to their soft plastic section you can find the versacraw and they're in stock here you can buy them here um and you can see all the different rigging variations and all that stuff they're pretty cool little trailers they work really well um, but that's what I would throw. And I basically tried to design it so you could have three colors, green pumpkin, bass whacker for kind of like a watermelony color, like a clear water color and a black and blue. You pick the three sizes of trailers, you get nine packs of trailers. That's still quite a few trailers, but that's enough for all of your applications. You don't have to bring 30 packages or 40 packages of trailers. I used to do that. And in my little 19 foot Triton, it was an absolute nightmare. I'm telling you guys, I do not have enough space for all that. Honestly, I don't have enough space for all the stuff I'm carrying right now. So this is really important to me trying to figure and dial this in because I think that if I could make this work, I'm saving myself space. I'm saving myself brain power because I don't have to think about everything so much. I just think about where are the bass going to be, and then I have my tools right here that are in this nice chart, it's simple, it's easy, and I just pick up these baits when those fish are in those such scenarios, and I just catch them. And I'm confident in all these baits, so I, th I feel like it would work. Um, let me just see here. Uh, dangerous get locked in on a couple baits when fishing is unpredictable. That's definitely true, and I guess in my mind, this is not... I mean, 10 different baits is a lot of baits. I mean, I know it's saying a few baits, but this is a lot of different baits between a shaky head, a swing head, a flipping jig, a hair jig. That's a lot of stuff. And I also have a whole other slide. So I'm not just doing crank or just doing jigs. I also have a whole thing for crank baits. So you have crank baits and you have jigs. So that's a, I mean, that's so many baits. Uh, it's so much. It's so many things to think about. Uh, I mean, that's basically, I think I have like 15 or, or 13 crankbaits. So you basically have 23 different fishing lures you have to learn to throw. So 10 jigs, 13 crankbaits, that's a ton of stuff. So that is kind of what I'm thinking about. Um, I think that uh, the simple Joe says this is a great approach to start each fishing trip. If you don't get a jig or a crankbait, then switch to lure you have confidence in. So for me, like a jig and a crankbait, um, those are my confidence lures. And so that's something that for me, if I'm not getting bit on one of these two baits, I might as well just pack it up and go home. But I do think one thing that could be helpful too is if you start getting bit, for example, on a jig, maybe you can get a couple bites in a jig, but you can get more bites by switching to a Texas rig beaver bait or a Senko or a Wacky Rig Worm. You start here and then... Maybe you have some auxiliary baits around. So like, let's say you start catching them really well on a hair jig and they stop biting. Maybe still have a couple of flutter spoons in the boat so that you can give those fish a different look. So maybe you don't only fish these baits, but this is what I would start my day with because this is what I know I have confidence in and works well for me personally. And then maybe I have a few auxiliary baits, but maybe I just have a box of like a handful of auxiliary baits. So I'm not having to have everything. Cause sometimes I'll go to the lake with like 16 rods with all these baits rigged up. And what do I end up catching them on? Football jig and a crankbait or a flipping jig and a crankbait. That's it. I don't catch them on anything else. I'll throw other stuff. I just don't catch them. Um, so, and let's see here. 
Let's see here. Okay, a blade. Some people are saying blade jig. Some people are saying top waters. Yeah, there's some. There's. I think the swim jig could take care of the top water ish thing for the the jig part. But we definitely need to talk about the crankbait. So, um, sounds like everyone is. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, it looks like everyone is good. Sorry, I'm just reading through these comments. Okay, so that's it. So this for me is my jigs. Let's jump to crankbaits. This is the one I'm less sure on because I I have some crankbaits on here that I I'm confident ish in, but not really. And I'm I have some some question marks here. So my crankbait one is not fully fleshed out. I also realize I'm missing top waters, which is an oversight. I might need to just add an extra column that's just top waters, and maybe I just add like a whopper plopper and like a pop R, and then. You can't really do a suspended top water. So maybe uh, this doesn't cover everything. There's probably some times when a top water would probably be a good idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, this isn't perfect, but now you guys are saying that. But let's let's be, bear with me for this one for a second. Let's just walk through this so I can show you what I'm thinking about here. And again, this is just a theory. This is not perfection. This is just what I've kind of went through. So this is, uh, oh, wake baits kind of top waters. There you go. Okay, Ryan, you're coming up clutch here. Uh, maybe I need to just add a wake bait. Um, I think that might be the deal um, because it's still a crank bait. It's just a, like, wait, let me pull up a wake bait. Let me pull up Navionics or sorry, Google. Okay, wake bait. Yeah, yeah, wake bait is basically, it's a crankbait with, that runs really, really shallow. Okay, so we'll add a wake bait in there probably at some point. Maybe I just need to, I'm not gonna update this chart as we speak because that's just gonna be too much uh, time and stuff like that. I'd have to make a whole new column, but let's just say we add a whole other column over here on the left side that's like top water and we have maybe like a whopper plopper and then a wake bait. That'd probably be my two baits that I need to have on here that they're missing. But for the style again, you have power, finesse, and suspended. So for the zero to three foot range, my power crankbait, Randy has gotten into me with all the mega bass. You guys are gonna see more mega bass on here than I used to throw, but this is just Randy's, Randy's got me uh, going on it and I've watched him catch too many fish up shallow and in the boat with me. So. This Mega Bass S crank, absolutely love it. It flex off cover really well. I used to throw a KVD 1.5 square bill, and I, I would break one, the lip off of one, like every single trip. And not all of them have the perfect hunting action that I'm looking for. So it really sucks when you break a good one. They're only five bucks, but this uh, S crank, haven't broken one yet, broken the lip or anything. And it has that natural hunting action out of the package. So I really like that in the 1.2 size. For my finesse style crankbait in the zero to four foot or zero to three foot range is the Mega Bass Super Z Z2 crankbait. Randy caught so many fish with me. I think it was last year or two years ago on this bait. I think it was last year. Throwing down a spinning rod. And I honestly have not thrown this bait that much. And I didn't really have like a finesse style crankbait in that zero to three foot range that I've relied on. But Randy throws this thing all the time and always catches them when I'm in the boat with him and just around... He's caught him in recent tournaments on it. So I'm going to start throwing this bait more. I have a few of them that he, that he got me. So I'm going to throw some of this. And that's going to be my, like, this is kind of a bait that I haven't experimented a lot with, but I know works. Like, I've seen it firsthand catch a lot of good fish. So that's some crankbait I'm adding in. And then for the suspended, again, baits that kind of work in the middle of the water column, I got a lipless crankbait. Striking red eye shad. Can't beat it. Just a great bait. Not expensive. Half ounce. I can rip it through grass, fish it burn it over flats, stuff like that. It's a great bait. From the four to seven foot range for the power crankbait, I live in the Ozarks. You got to have some sort of wiggle wart or rock crawler. I love the Spro Rock Crawler 55. Great crankbait, um, deflects off rocks really well. It works as well in the summer as it does in the winter for me. So I catch a lot of fish on this. For my finesse bait, I'm going with a sneaky, amazing bait that caught so many big fish on. It's not actually this exact one. Um, I use an old Strike King Custom Shop crankbait, which is basically the exact same bait. Um, they just don't make it anymore. But it's this old school balsa baits, Wesley Strader W2. It's a flat-sided balsa crankbait. It's just an amazing bait in four to seven foot of water. When the water is cold, when the fish are not biting very well, if it's super hot even, this is a great mid 
depth, like four to seven foot crankbait. Then for suspended, I did start adding jerk baits in here because really on the suspended, once you get past the, the lipless crankbait in the shallow water, you need to start going to something that actually suspends from a crankbait perspective. And jerk baits have lips, they have a bill, they have hooks. Basically, it's a crankbait. So for my uh, jerk bait number one, I'm going with the Megabass Vision 110 plus one in that four to seven foot range. I will throw this even where I'll throw the uh, Vision 110 standard. All I'll do is just put it on heavier fishing line. I don't like to buy Vision 110s and Vision 110 plus ones. I'll just buy a plus one and then use heavier fishing line to make it go a little bit shallower. So I'll usually throw it on like 10 or 12 pound test normally, and then I'll throw it on like 14, 15 pound test if I want it to go shallower. Uh, for eight to 12 foot zone, uh, Strike King 5XD, I was very conflicted on this one because there's a bunch of baits I would actually put in this 8 to 12 foot zone. I like a Striking Series 6. I like the Mega Bass Deep X300. I've been trying that bait out quite a bit. Uh, I like the uh, DT10 from Rapala. But I kind of was thinking about it and I've caught more big fish on a 5XD than all those baits. So I just put the 5XD in here for now. That may be subject to change, but that's what I have right now dives 8 to 12 foot really good bait for the finesse bait i didn't have a finesse 8 to 12 foot diving crankbait so this is one i've never thrown i put this on here literally right now because uh, i've never tried it and i've never thought about finesse cranking an 8 to 12 foot which is probably a mistake on my part and it's an oversight and it's actually cool that i'm building this chart because i'm seeing the gaps in my game i didn't have a crankbait here i didn't have a crankbait here so actually I didn't have a crankbait here either we'll talk about that in a second but this is the Spro Little John Baby DD. It's like two and a half inches long, dives 10 to 14 feet, a lot smaller than the 5XD. And I'm going to try it because it's kind of more flat sided than the normal crankbaits on, on here. These are more rounded. This is more flat sided. I think it could work really well. So I'm going to purchase some of those uh, probably tomorrow, get those shipped over from Tackle Warehouse and give them a shot. Uh, for the 8 to 12 foot range suspended on, or for the suspended baits, I'm throwing the Smithwick Perfect 10 Rogue. So this is a crazy good jerk bait. I caught a 10 pounder on it this last, or this year in the spring, caught a bunch of big fish on it. It has a big profile. It gets big bites for me. And in that 8 to 12 foot range is absolutely ideal for it. I love this bait. Um, not expensive. It just works. It definitely doesn't work that well in 4 to 7 foot, and it doesn't work that well past 12 to 17 feet. It's really just like an 8 to 12 foot. That's the zone for it. So I just throw it in that zone over brush piles and standing timber and stuff. And if they're on it, I mean, they're on it. For a 12 to 17 foot range, we got the Striking 6XD for my power crankbait. Uh, you guys, that no more words. You guys know I love the 6XD. I catch a bunch of fish on it in my videos. For the finesse bait, this is one that Randy told me about, and I've since heard so much about it and i have no idea how i never heard about it all these years but it's the mega bass deep six crankbait basically it's like a california like legend everyone throws this bait um i think the guys over at tactical bassin made a bait that's very similar to this um they have a one from river to sea but basically the deep six is just like this cult favorite over in california and it's known as a wintertime crankbait which is interesting to me because it, it does have a little bit narrower wobble than the 6XD. So I'm going to try this as my finesse 12 to 17 foot crankbait. I got some of them um, already that I've, I haven't really thrown them though. I just heard about them and I got some, but I need to throw this. Really, this finesse crankbait realm is pretty weak for me other than my balsa crankbait. And I catch a bunch of fish in this balsa. So I'm kind of interested to see if I get better results with these finesse crankbaits at times when maybe I'm trying to force feed them these top row crankbaits, maybe going to the Super Z2 or the Mega Bass Deep 6, I'll get some extra bites. Interested to try it and also the Spro Little John DD, uh, Baby DD. We'll see how that works. For 17 to, uh, or 12 to 17 feet on my suspended, that's the Mega Bass Vision 110 Plus 2. It's the only jerk bait I know I can consistently get down to like, 16 feet of water especially if i weight it properly you can actually have it slow sink and you can get it down really deep love that vision 110 plus two caught a bunch of fish on it this year already so that's a great bait 
18 to 30 feet, we have a striking uh, 10XD. I've caught some big fish on this over the years as well. Um, pretty self-explanatory. It just goes 18 to 30 feet deep. I have to long line it uh, or basically make super long cast and like let the spool stay unengaged and like move my trolling motor back like 50 feet, then start reeling. And if you long line it, you can get down to like 27 feet, 28 feet of water. So that's a really good bait. Um, down to about 30 feet is the max I can feel comfortable getting it without doing crazy stuff. Uh, like long lining with like a jumbo spool and doing weird stuff. And I don't really like doing that. So, um, great power crankbait. Problem I'm running into is I don't have any finesse crankbait or suspended jerk baits that get down 18 to 30 feet deep. Now I do have one solution to this. Now I want to hear your opinion on this cause this is kind of crazy, but I got one of those mega bass deep six that bait that went 12 to 17 feet what i did is i put this little ball this weight it's a little drop shot weight i put it on the hook and my thought is maybe if i can get this bait to slowly sink with that heavy weight and then crank it through in that 17 foot range uh, or sorry that uh, 18 to 30 foot range like actually have it sink then reel it maybe i can trigger some extra fish now, I don't want to do this when it's around cover because this will just hang up since it's sinking. But what I'm thinking about is if maybe this could work on like flatter rocky points or on places where I'm not going to get hung up, maybe I can throw this thing down there, let it sink down almost all the way to the bottom, then reel it and burn it across the bottom and hit off stuff. Um, but I don't know if this is actually going to work. I'm really scared to try it because... If it doesn't work, I'm just going to lose like a $20 crankbait. But, you know, that's what we got to do here. Fish the moment, we got to experiment. So I'm going to experiment with this. Uh, I don't think it would work very well on like a 6XD. Uh, I just, I feel like this body shape is better for this sort of deal, this more finesse style. Uh, and I can already get a big 10XD down there. So I need to test it on a bait like this. So I'm just going to try it. I have that little weight on there. And I'm just going to try to suspend or sink that bait down just a little bit and reel it in. Another way I thought about that is what Ryan says is Carolina rig your crankbaits. That's what I was going to say. Carolina rigging a crankbait. I've heard people talk about that. And that way I can Carolina rig any bait. I could throw any of these baits that are here and Carolina rig them. And what I mean, what... Ryan means by that is literally taking a Carolina rig weight, like a one ounce weight, fire it out there uh, with a with a leader and then a crankbait tied to it three or four feet or maybe two foot, I don't know how long the leader should be, and then just basically reel in that Carolina rig weight, maybe even do like an ounce and a half, like a super heavy weight or two one ounce weights. I have no idea how much weight you would need to keep that crankbait down there so you could reel it fast enough. But maybe Carolina rigging a crankbait could be the solution to this really deep range and that's something that I'm definitely going to try as well so I'm thinking about this little ball deal little drop shot weight on the front hook hanger and also Carolina rigging some crankbaits I can then do that with like some less expensive crankbaits than a mega bass and we'll see if that works too but that's something we're going to experiment with because maybe that would be a really good idea people say uh, it works, so hopefully we can uh, we can figure it out. I the one thing I'm scared to death of is if I have a one ounce weight in 30 foot of water and I have a bait with treble hooks. There's so much leverage from that weight thrashing around that it's already hard to keep fish pegged on a crankbait. I would just think it's a nightmare to keep them pegged with a Carolina rig and a crankbait. That sounds miserable. But we're gonna try it anyways. We got some deep fish on Table Rock that we're gonna mess around with that this year. So that's my list. I got. Power, finesse, suspended. I would amend this uh, list by adding another column here of top water. Um, and I'd probably have a little, add a little wake bait and uh, maybe a buzz bait or a whopper plopper or something to this just to get some top water action. Um, I have a, the Mega Bass Eye Jack is my favorite wake bait. And then I'd probably throw like a, a whopper plopper, River to Sea whopper plopper uh, on there. So that's my list. I got a whopper plopper, that coming. Um, and then all these crankbaits, and this basically gives me 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 different crankbaits. I probably could have done that math easier this way, but uh, 13 different crankbaits, 10 different jigs. That's still a very overwhelming number of bait combinations and baits to throw. 
I think that I should, if I can't get bit on 10 different jigs or 13 different crankbaits when I go to the lake, I don't think that it's the bait's fault. I think it's my fault for being in the wrong area and not being around the fish. I don't know if that's true or not, but that just feels correct to me. I feel like I can manipulate these different baits, whether it's with a hair jig for suspended fish really deep, a shaky head, um, you know, a little finesse Ned rig kind of jig like the peewee football jig or the suspended swim jig, or then throw in these crankbaits. There's got to be, this has to cover everything. If, again, adding the top waters. If you have the top waters, this has to cover everything. I don't, is there anything I'm missing? Um, let's see here. Uh, you didn't hear it from me, but those old cotton cordell floating traps on a Carolina rig. So I've been told, uh, from living Missouri outdoors. Hey, giving me good juice there too, by the way, living Missouri outdoors. I don't know if you're here, but you want our Bridgeford beef jerky giveaway. Send me an email at info at for your free case of Bridgeford beef jerky. Um, let's see here. Just put a bill on a spook. Um, Man, yeah, I think so. Cliff says he agrees. I don't know what else what else we could be adding here to make this any better. Um, Guy B says, wouldn't the weight of a Carolina rig detrimentally affect the weight, the feel of the crankbait? That might be true. You might not be able to feel those fish bite it as well. So I don't know how you would adjust for that. Uh, I know throwing a Carolina rig with braid is not a good idea because your braid will get chipped in the rocks and break off. I've been there, done that. I thought that the braid would give you better feel, um, but I don't know. I don't know how that would work. If you did fluoro, if you did a short leader of fluoro, like twelve to eighteen inches, I don't know. I need to test it. I have a local community college pool that's like seventeen, eighteen feet deep. I'll probably just go test it in there and do a video on that at some point to maybe test that out because that probably is the best course of action. Test it in a pool first where we can see it. I will get some underwater footage of it and then watch you take it to the lake and try it because I don't think that there's any other way to um, to really know what's going on. I just feel like that might be the best best case scenario. Um, <laughs> could be really brave and use an $8 tungsten weight on that Carolina rig. Perfect. I'll throw my $20 mega bass crankbait with my $8 tungsten weight. I'll do a real gold, uh, spacer. So it's like made of 24 karat gold. We'll have the most expensive Carolina rig ever created. Or we could do an Alabama rig with floating flukes on there and then Carolina rig that that's even better right there. Um, good deal. Oh, Timo's asking about my new electronics guides. Yeah, let me talk about that real quick because I know that some of you guys have been curious and I haven't mentioned them on live streams. So let me share that really quick. One second here. I need to talk about this. Okay, so let me pull this up. Uh, what Timo's talking about are my new sonar guides. What's going on here? Oh, here we go. My new sonar guides are over here on fishmoment.com. So if you go to fishmoment.com, guys, it's my website, and you go to the sonar guides page, I just put these together. Basically what it is, and I've been getting so many questions over the years about how do I set up my fish finders and the step-by-step process of doing it. And what I did is tried to make these the simplest guide to follow where you can literally go step-by-step and set up the settings in your fish finder without having me getting in the boat with you. That's one thing I've been, a lot of people want me to get on the boat and help them with their sonar settings. And some guys really want, you know, the detailed dialed in settings and all that stuff. And then some guys just want to get their settings right. And this is what these sonar guides are for. It's for the guys who got their fish finder and they just have no idea what they're doing. They don't want to spend the time watching 50 YouTube videos to figure out how to change every single dial and setting and stuff like that. If you just want to save yourself time, get the right settings so that you know what you're doing with your fish finder, these are the things for you. We currently have three of them available uh, right now. I'm working on more, so don't worry. More are coming. Uh, I actually have some already ready to go. I just need to get them posted. But we have um, this uh, Humber Helix Gen 3, the Lowrance Elite FS, the Lowrance HDS Live. I think we have the Lowrance Hook Reveal coming, the Lowrance Elite TI2, and also a Lowrance HDS Carbon. So all of those are coming. And this is basically the um, 
the guides that will walk you through every single setting that I use to set Fish Finder. But it's not just like, here is a list of settings. It's actually like, go through, like I'll show you one of these pictures here. It's literally like, scroll, stop right there. Okay. It's like, scroll up with the direction pad and then select the view tab. Scroll to the right. I'm trying to like, give you all the step-by-step directions. So guys who really struggle with technology, basically I designed them for guys like Randy. Uh, Randy is not the best with technology. And when I had him start making our Fish the Moment Lake breakdowns, these where we put the the waypoints on the uh, on the SD card and stuff. Oh my gosh, it was it was so much work training Randy on how to do PowerPoint and how to um, put all the descriptions in, how to drop the waypoints onto a map, all that stuff. And I went through that process with him to train him how to do it. And I tried to use that same approach when I made these sonar guides. So they may seem a little bit handholdy, maybe a little bit like slow for some guys. Some guys are just like, okay, I know the settings. Let me just drop them in. But for other guys, I know it's a lot harder to navigate these fish finders. There's, I mean, these are 50 page guides. Every single one of them is 50 pages because there's so many settings you have to go through, go into each menu, setting them all up, all that stuff. It's very complicated. So I tried to make it as simple and streamlined as you can. Uh, again, they're not for everyone. If you just want the settings and boom, 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 you guys can go watch YouTube videos. There are other guys who make YouTube videos on the settings. That's This is not what this is for. This is for the guys who really struggle with technology and getting the the settings put into their fish finder properly and or the guys who don't want to spend 30 hours watching all the settings videos from all these different guys to figure out what's right and wrong these are the exact settings i use so if you just want to skip out on all that time researching too just get this set your settings and they're done one thing i've noticed with a lot of guys too is they'll get these settings and they'll put them in and they're like oh my fish finder doesn't look like what the example images look like well it's probably because your fish finder has been installed improperly and that's one of the most common mistakes i see is that the reason you can't get your settings set up properly is because you literally have the graph installed improperly and the only way you're going to know that is if you get a guide like this and actually put in every single setting the right way if all of your settings are set up just like they are on this guide there's nothing wrong with the settings themselves it's actually the fish finder installation and that's why you have to go to guys like the bass tank where they actually install your fish finder the right way get all of your um uh, transducers hooked up right power supplies making sure that you have the right gauge wires going everywhere transducer placement making sure that you don't have any sort of frays or nicks in your transducer cable uh, sometimes the transducer heads go bad there's a lot of things that can go wrong uh, in fish finder installation that have nothing to do with your settings and you'll never know if they're wrong unless you get it set up properly and then you'll know. So um, again, that's what these settings guys are for. I think I've had some people who have complained already that the guide was uh, too like too long, like there was too much going on. Um, there was maybe like, they just wanted like a list of settings that I use. And again, the goal of this is to walk you through the entire process from booting up the unit, restoring defaults, setting all the settings perfectly and something you can follow easily so if you again are maybe a little bit technically challenged maybe have a little bit of a struggle that's what these are for and i hope that makes sense i don't want people to have these lofty expectations that these are doing anything crazy it's not like i'm uh, i mean obviously i'm giving you the settings i use but it's not like it's going to unlock new menus that are hidden in the code of the fish finder it's like the settings that are there i'll show you the settings that i use and that's what's what that's what we adjust. It's not like you're getting like secret setting menus with this. It's just this all the settings, there's what they are. So hopefully that makes sense. That was kind of long-winded, but um that is that's the deal. A uh, couple questions. Any uh Garmin products coming? Uh I'm not sure on that one yet. I have a relationship with uh Hummingbird and with Lawrence where they basically gave me the okay to make these sonar guides, which is really nice of them. Uh, I don't have any contacts over at Garmin, so I don't uh, I, I don't want to make anything like this without the okay of the manufacturer. Um, not that these settings have anything to do with the manufacturer. They don't give any input on what to put or what to do. I just need the okay to like use a Lawrence picture, for example, in my thumbnail here. That's a, that's no bueno if... Uh, if I don't get the okay from those guys. So I just want to make sure I'm ever doing anything with the up and up. So for now, it's just Lawrence and Humminbird hoping to build relationships with those guys over at Garmin. But for now, that's just not uh, not where we're at. Um, when's the video coming out uh, for the sonar for the 
Oh, that's okay. Yeah, let me show you guys that. So I'm just going to switch over to this big thing real quick. So a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this and I have not had a chance to... Let me pull this up. Sorry, guys. I'm going to pull up my Instagram page because I have... Let's see here. I have this contraption I put in my boat to test all the different types of forward-facing sonar. So basically, we put this crazy thing on my boat. Um, I don't have any... They need me to log in. I'm not, I'm not logged in, but this is, you'll get a little sneak peek right here. You can go to my Instagram page and Facebook page and you'll see it. We call it the forward facing trident. We have the mega live, live scope and active target all hooked up on the exact same pole. And I was able to record them simultaneously. And I actually did the test. The problem was that there was a massive amount of interference between them. And I thought that it was okay when I first initially filmed the video, but then I recorded internally on the actual fish finder all of the recordings and the interference was worse on the recordings that I recorded than it was actually in real in, in live person when I was looking at them so I actually just went out today literally today redid the entire video redid all the tests uh I didn't quite get all the shots I wanted to because we've had a major weather changes since then so I'm a little bit bummed but I think I did a good enough job to show you the differences and uh, tried the uh, best I could with the lakes that I was on in this area. There's just not as many offshore fish right now that are set up to look really pretty on this active target uh, where I'm going, so uh, or on the live scope and stuff. But what I basically had to do is film all of them individually with all the other ones turned off because interference was just too bad. And I also recorded the screen itself rather than doing internal recordings just to get the fairest test possible. I also did the test on a very public body of water that's stained i'm not going to these picturesque idealistic lakes i could go to like beaver lake and find the prettiest tree and get the clearest possible image but that's not realistic for a lot of anglers i tried to go to a very normal lake normal water visibility is like two to three feet kind of rocky to muddy bottom it's just a very like normal lake and i tried to put it in the most fair test i could it, so you're not going to get the marketing quality images. And I think that's kind of what you guys want anyways. A lot of the companies and stuff, obviously it's in their best interest to show the prettiest pictures. But then you get to the lake and you see like, oh, that picture doesn't look quite as good on mine as it did in the marketing picture. Well, maybe there's a little bit of Photoshop going on there. Just like everything, you know, if you look at any sort of uh, picture of, of like advertising for McDonald's, the Big Mac doesn't look like the Big Mac they do all kinds of fluffing and things. You can watch videos on this. It's kind of crazy how they do it. But that's kind of what happens with some of these uh, images as well. They're not giving you the, you know, and maybe they're not touching them up that much. Maybe they're going to the perfect lake and the perfect day and the perfect scenario to get those images. So I wanted to give you the real images, like what you're going to see real life on a normal lake. And that's what the tests are going to be. And that video is going to be dropping this Friday. I'm going to be editing it the next two days nonstop because I've already been delayed on it long enough. So we'll be getting that out on the main Fish the Moment YouTube channel. So that is pretty much what we got. Randy's over there at the Bass Mess or at the uh, Toyo Series Championship. So he'll be back next week to tell us all about it. Uh, we have our Bridgeford Beef Jerky Giveaway. If you guys are still uh, interested in signing up, just leave a comment down below in the actual video. Not in the live chat here, but actually... Um, uh, actually the comments of the YouTube video. Sorry, I've been talking for an hour and a half straight. And if you do that, you'll have a chance to win a case of Bridgeford Beef Jerky. With your comment, just let me know what you think about my crankbait jig idea of simplifying it down to 23 baits, which is still not simple, but it's more simple than other situations and try to see if that maybe will make me a better fisherman let me know what you think about that concept if you do you have a chance to win a free case of bridgeford beef jerky living uh missouri outdoors congrats on winning this week's giveaway and if you guys do want to check out any of the uh, lake breakdowns or sonar guides check them out over here at fishthemoment.com we have these new sonar guides up i'll be posting more as the coming days happen uh, i've just been delayed because of all that reshooting of the live scope video i had to kind of push my schedule back and also check out some of our uh, lake breakdowns randy has a ton of these fall lake breakdowns coming out every single day he's knocking these out like crazy 
I've been delayed because of these sonar guides on my offshore breakdowns, but I'm going to try to get more of these out, especially for the winter time, so you're going to have to see more of those coming to the website. And then finally, if you guys want some installation help, definitely check out the Bass Tank. They're a sponsor of the stream. Uh, really great guys over there. John Sukup, congrats over there getting the fourth place finish. He led after two days of the Open, uh, one of the owners of the Bass Tank, and he is on it. So if you guys want a really good angler helping uh, direct your installation and stuff, he is right there in the shop all the time and that's the bass tank so that is it guys i talked a lot tonight by myself my throat is sore but i feel very happy because i got to talk to you guys about fishing and uh it was a lot of fun so hopefully you guys enjoyed the stream thanks for hanging out with me tonight we'll see you guys next week back with our normal um schedule with randy and we'll be talking about his recent tournaments so thanks again guys and have a great night